Great, thank you and good morning everyone. It's wonderful to be here today and so great to see so many folks here who are excited to learn about and practice communicating science. So as Monica said, I was, I was asked here today to talk a little bit about my work and specifically my experiences working at the science policy boundary. So we're all, or I'm gonna guess, that everybody in this room is familiar with communicating to other scientists, whether that's in writing a paper or developing a presentation, but in this ever more connected world that we live in, I'm guessing that you might also be feeling some of that pressure to step outside of that kind of traditional audience of talking to other scientists. And that may be because you're, maybe even you're feeling compelled to do so because you see connections between your work and the critical issues of our time. Or maybe you've made a really interesting or exciting observation that you're hoping to share with folks because you think it might inspire them to be more connected and get excited about the natural world just like you are. So I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about my experiences working specifically at the science policy boundary, but also my experiences in communicating to audiences um, even beyond policymakers. But before I dive into my work, I wanted to start a little bit uh, and tell you a little bit about myself and tell you my story about why I'm passionate about the work that I do and why I uh, continue to endure <laughs> in this often kind of arduous and difficult path of trying to bring science to the table. And so I'm gonna rewind the clocks back a while ago. <laughs> and I can still remember a time when I was sitting on a rock on the coast of the Puget Sound and uh, had my hand on my first fishing rod and I felt that tug and I reeled in my very first fish with the help of my father. And again, I was four. And I can remember jumping out of the car and running across the beach and staring at the waves of the Pacific Ocean the very first time I stood there when I was six. And I can remember donning a mask and putting on scuba gear and jumping in the water off of Catalina Island when I was 11 and dropping down and watching the seals and sea lions dart darting in and out of the kelp forests. I was hooked with the ocean from that first moment, from that first fish that I caught over 30 years ago. And I'm just as passionate, or even more so today, at working with the ocean and making sure that our state and federal policymakers are making those policies based on science to make sure that those amazing ecosystems that we all know and love persevere. So in that space, uh, way back when, um, you know, my academic and professional career has been a long, windy road with no shortage of uh, adventures. When I was an undergraduate at Rutgers University and from there through to when uh, I started graduate school, I researched kelp forests in Alaska. I researched a multitude of habitats off Bermuda from seagrass beds to coral reefs to rocky intertidal zones. I even discovered new species in Thailand when I was doing surveys on the mudflats on the southwestern coast. And for the few years between undergraduate and graduate school, I worked for a variety of conservation and restoration organizations, conducting habitat restoration, like planting trees or shucking really uh, smelly salmon carcasses into rivers to bring those nutrients back to the ocean, from the ocean back to the river systems. And I've done environmental education using hands-on experiential learning techniques. And what you're seeing, just as an example in that top right photo, those are a couple of my students who are involved in an activity that involves a sniffing a little canister that's filled with a particular herb or spice, and the activity is meant to teach them about how salmon find their way back to their natal streams. Now, it was also during this time that I gained my first policy and science advocacy experience. I served as a representative on several county marine resources advisory committees. And it was really during that particular experience that I started to realize that if I wanted to work at this science policy boundary, I needed to get an advanced degree. So off to grad school I went. Um, and this is what brought me to California for the second time. Now during grad school, I conducted field work in 17 countries and territories, working with fishermen and other local people uh, to do natural history management and fisheries of invertebrates in the neotropical Western Atlantic. I also worked as a curator in the Museum of Paleontology, which taught me the value of museum collections and also helped me hone my organization skills. I mentored students, developed new curricula, and taught a variety of courses from invertebrate zoology, intro to oceans, and principles of conservation. And it's William Yates once wrote, education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. And in my experience, that fire is not lit just in your students, 
It's also lit and that fans the flame within you to help you get reconnected and more passionate about that subject that you're teaching. Now my research, conservation, and education work have taken me all around the world, introducing me to 19 countries across three continents. But by the time I finished graduate school, I was ready to settle in and uh, explore California and just focus in and start to make a difference here at home. Now my work at Ocean Science Trust may not take me all around the world, but it's anything but dull. And it brings together skills and expertise built through my academic research, restoration, environmental education, and advocacy work. Now there are many centers, academic programs, organizations, et cetera, devoted to communicating science and training others or helping folks to do so. And there's an even smaller number of organizations who specialize in working at the boundary between science and policy. And we are one of those organizations. And just to take a step back for a moment, we live and work in an incredibly unique state. It's a state in which the door for science is wide open. Case in point, the Ocean Science Trust was established by state legislation. We are an independent nonprofit whose job is to bring science to bear on public policy decisions. It's our job to bring that unbiased independent science to the state. And the state was visionary enough to recognize that they needed an independent organization to do that. And as I said, I've worked all around the world. This is the only place that the door for science is wide open. And they even went beyond that and are actually recognizing the need for an independent organization to deliver that science to them. It's actually really incredible. So who are we? We're a small interdisciplinary team of ecologists, social scientists, policy experts, communications experts, technology experts, and some administrative gurus to help us with our grant management and fundraising, of course. And now I came to this job with some previous experience in communicating science to non-scientists and some policy experience, but I had not yet worked in California. And well, sometimes the best way to learn is to jump in feet first. My second week of work <laughs> involved a whirlwind tour of Northern California, hosting small group meetings and large community gatherings with fishermen, tribal governments, local and state agencies, environmental nonprofits, people from both sides of the MPA aisle and everywhere in between. The goal of the trip was first and foremost relationship building, to introduce ourselves to that community and to help understand what their monitoring priorities are, what their local priorities are for MPA monitoring that we were about to begin in that region. And what no member of my team knew then, but what we know now, was that we were the f that on the first of what was to become a weekly trip to the North Coast to work and get to know that community. Now, in the work that we do at Ocean Science Trust, we use a wide range of communications tools to share our program and project results. We develop and manage a website called oceanspaces.org where we post products, blogs, and other communications um, and communicate our project results. Now, Ocean Spaces, if you're not familiar with it, is the online community where we, uh, where we bring together the broad community of California and we track the health of California's oceans. It's the one-stop shop where you can find all of the information about MPA monitoring from the raw data straight through to the summary reports.
essentially a broader community with the scientific information about the health of our oceans that the idea behind ocean spaces was sort of crystallized. There's a lot of scope. Let's stop it there. So keeps going. But that's just one of the videos that's on Ocean Spaces to help introduce folks to why that tool exists. Now, in addition to the information and products that you can find on Ocean Spaces, we also post blogs to other websites. We've been interviewed for a wide variety of print and broadcast media. And of course, we also post things on social media. We actually have a dedicated staff person who does that. Now, now, for the majority of our communications across all of these products, our target audience is decision makers. But we do aim to communicate our work to a much broader audience, which is one of the reasons why everything ends up on Ocean Spaces. And so we then develop, oftentimes, multiple products that are targeting very particular audiences that we distribute across a wide variety of media, from reports and infographics to blogs and social media. And as I mentioned, we also host in-person community meetings to reach that broader audience, especially those, and there are many, who don't engage with materials online. And these in-person meetings are really important. They allow us to have two-way communication, which can help us to modify and update our approach and our messages to meet the needs of the broader community. As an, and as, as an example of how this works in practice, after the North Central Coast FDA baseline program was completed, all of those data and those technical reports were submitted, and those are all publicly available on Ocean Spaces. Now, beyond that, we then developed a series of reports, products, and an executive summary that we call the State of the Region Report. And this report synthesizes information across over 20 products and reports and data to summarize ecological and socioeconomic conditions in the North Central Coast region. We developed print reports and an interactive web page on Ocean Spaces, wrote blogs, posted to social media, and sent out a press release. And then we hosted a series of community gatherings actually this past December to communicate that information out to the public. And just this past week, we presented those results together with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife at the California Fish and Game Commission meeting to help inform their five-year management review of the region's MPAs. And the team on this broader project was composed of not just scientists. We also had communications and design experts and technology experts. So this is a good reminder that you don't have to be an expert in everything. It's actually probably not possible to be an expert in science, management, technology, and communications all at once. You just have to know when to seek additional support and to have some inkling of how and where to get it. So over the 10 years of managing conservation projects from both within a traditional academic setting and from within nonprofits, I certainly have many stories to tell. And I'm going to share a few of these with you while offering guiding principles for communicating science to inform decision making. And there are a few uh, guiding principles that have emerged over, over these years. So like with anything, there's a starting point to communicating science. But that starting point, particularly at that boundary between science and policy making, has nothing to do with sharing information. It actually is the complete opposite. The first principle is to start with understanding the science needs of your users and the, the decision makers in particular. Before you begin crafting the communications products or deciding what outlets to use, and ideally before you even go out in the field to collect data, you need to begin by reaching out to those decision makers because this will help you to define the end product and that end result of your research trying to get an understanding of what the decision maker opportunity is. What, if any, are the relevant mandates or existing legislation or policies that you're trying to inform? Is there a specific cycle to that relevant management uh, decision that you're trying to inform? And are there any gaps or information gaps that the decision makers would like your help filling? Initiating a conversation with the intended users of your work ensures that the products aligned with their needs, both in terms of the questions and being asked and answered by your work, but also in the timing of when the product is released. But how does one navigate this crazy world of California policies and agency mandates? Well, we at Ocean Science Source, we developed a tool that we call Science Needs Assessment. It's a handbook that we're actually going to release later this fall. And just something to keep in mind is to remember that science is a way of knowing. It's not just the knowledge. So understanding the science needs of those decision makers is not just a simple list of facts and data. It's not just a question. It includes understanding how they need it, when they need it, 
who they need it from, and what kind of process they need it to be delivered to them to make sure that they can actually take it in. So since the launch of Ocean Science Stress Monitoring Program in 2006, we've worked together with our partners at the Department of Fish and Wildlife to develop the state's scientific monitoring framework, monitoring plans, and to design and implement monitoring across the state. It's all guided by the Marine Life Protection Act, which actually lays out really clear goals for what we're supposed to do with MPAs and around MPA monitoring. However, there's still a challenge when it comes to meeting the science needs for this program, even in situations when mandates and policies are very, very clearly laid out and accessible. What if there are multiple decision makers or state agencies who are, uh, have different science needs related to the same topic or issue? What if you as a scientific expert can see some new science need on the horizon that's not yet in an existing mandate or policy? Where it's part of our role at Ocean Science Trust as the lead on that MPA monitoring program to bring that new science need to the state and help them understand that this is something that's coming online in the future and help them to figure out a way to bring that into current actions and maybe even potentially into a policy down the line. Now, the second principle may seem obvious, know your audience. But you'd be surprised how many communications products are produced without having a clue who the, audi who the audience is you're actually trying to target. Sometimes understanding the science needs can help you identify that target audience. Oops. No, don't go back yet. When thinking about audience, it's not only important to develop for the development of the product, but also for the venue or the medium through which you plan to share it. In the early days of working for a nonprofit called Pacific Marine Research, they have a little program called Marine Science Float. Um, and in those early days, I actually failed to do that. I was leading a shipboard lesson and I, where I led shipboard lessons about ecology, natural history, oceanography, and conservation throughout the day to fourth to eighth grade students. And this one day I was on the boat and I was up setting up these wet tables after the uh, video dive came back up with some organisms that we wanted to share with the students. And, well, one of the chaperones came over to me, who uh, I'd kind of forgotten that there were chaperones in the audience on the boat as well. And the chaperone asks me, is the Puget Sound salt water? And mind you, this is after a 45 minute lesson about the natural history and how the water was formed and where it came from. And I started to realize that my communication style and what I was saying was very much targeted at those fourth to eighth grade students. But there are adults in the room too. And there are little things that you can do to tweak what you're saying, to you know, bring in an adult aim joke or an adult aim reference that can help draw that audience into the conversation too. Because even though they're not your target audience, they're an important audience to be considering in that situation. And this, this is a lesson that I certainly take into the work that I do now as well, because when I host meetings at a public venue, I make sure that I take the time to greet people as they're coming in, so that I can get to know who's going to be in the room when, before I'm standing up in front of them, because it's really important to know who you're speaking to. It's important to know who they represent, who they work for, what their background is, you can adjust your talking points and how you're communicating to make sure that you're saying things and focusing on the things that are most important and of most interest to your audience. And remember that there are a broad range of communications tools at your fingertips, from scientific publications straight through to social media. But not all audiences respond to the same tools. If you're trying to reach a legislator, that legislator is never going to read your scientific paper. It probably won't even read a summary report. In my experience, they'll read maybe a one-pager, or at least their staff will. So think of those smaller sound bites or those big headlines that you want to share with those higher-level folk. And by getting to know your audience, you gain a deeper understanding of their preferred outlets of communication, and thus can prioritize your efforts on those specific communications tools that your audience is using. And these are two of my students. Um, well, I have another student from Rain Room who's not in these days. Um, from back in 2010. Now, everyone was hesitant to swing out on these vines until one brave student grabbed the vine and swung out. And then a whole slew of other students, in trusting the student who jumped on there first, jumped on that vine and took that plunge. So build trust with your audience. By be they decision makers, NGOs, community members, whoever they may be, 
Communicating science requires you to get to know your audience, and I mean really get to know them. Building trust in you as an individual and in your organization as a whole ensures that your products will land with openness rather than resistance or distrust. If key communicators from your audience are trusting you, then their friends and colleagues will trust you as well. And for me, the challenge is not in building, not in that initial relationship building. The challenge is in cultivating the trust that fuels that enduring relationship which can then ultimately serve as an indicator of success in the project. And it takes active listening, connecting on a personal level, as you can imagine, many cups of coffee or maybe pints of beer, and ultimately patience. And through this relationship and trust building work, and I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, for the North Coast Baseline Program, we transformed the process and our approach to building a program, and the results were spectacular the most collaborative, inclusive, and comprehensive regional baseline program that we have in the state. And we built trust. That trust that we built with those folks four years ago, that trust still persists today. I can still pick up the phone and call them. They still pick up the phone and call me and share things that they wouldn't otherwise without that foundation of trust. So sometimes communications begins with building trust in the process to generate it. It ties the audience directly to the data so that they're invested in the project and are more likely to be supportive of the results. And in this world of science and more decision making, having support from a broad range of citizens can make the difference between something that's approved or rejected by the state commission. Because it's their job to ensure that constituents understand the issues and information being brought to bear in that public setting. Now, just last week, I was participating, or this past week, in the Golden Gate Waters Action Summit, and former assembly member and actually Santa Cruz County Treasurer Fred Keeley said something that was actually rather um, perfect for this presentation. So we don't see signs on people's yards that say, vote yes, measure A, raise your taxes. The signs say, vote yes, measure A, save our libraries. Vote yes, measure A, save our children. It's about the message. The bottom line is you need to have a clear, concise message, and you need to make it personal. You need to draw connections to people's lives, and you need to find a story that will draw them in, even if it means not sharing your favorite facts and details. Finally, communications is a process, and often the process is as important, if not more important, than the product itself. Product development, social media posts, blogs, etc., they can't stand alone. While important individually, they serve a higher purpose when brought together as components of a larger process. Understanding and connecting with the people and the communities is a vital part of the process of successful communications. We cannot solely rely on social media and other electronic forms of communication. There truly is no substitute for having that cup of coffee or going for a walk or actually sitting down and breaking bread with someone. So to help you remember these guiding principles, and since we all love acronyms, I created an acronym for everybody. Um, so just as a kind of final take home, just remember that scientists are not expected to have the answers to every question, nor are you expected to be experts at everything. Communications is a process, and you need a team to make it successful. And if you're interested in learning more about communicating science, I encourage you to seek out a mentor, speak with other boundary organization practitioners, attend colloquia like this one today, because we all need to learn and we all have ways to continue to build our own expertise. And so with that, just want to thank you again, and I look forward to hearing from many of you over the course of the morning.